Good evening. I'm, uh, I'm Steve Weberg with the public affairs staff here at the uh, Kansas City Public Library and just want to thank you all. It's great to have you with us this evening. Appreciate you coming. Everybody here at the Plaza Branch, many of you, many more of you who are watching from home via live stream, it's great to have you. Um, we're in the middle of a pretty special time here at the library. Thursday night, uh, I think, I, hopefully some of you were here, or uh, uh, actually at UMKC, we, we joined UMKC's MFA program in creative writing in our annual Writers for Readers fundraising program. It underwrites, among other things, a series of free writing classes for the public, three of which were on Saturday, all solid booked, uh, just a tremendous service we're able to offer to the community. Uh, Writers for Readers also uh, over, uh, underwrites the uh, National Maya Angelou Book Award, which uh, the library started three years ago with, with UMKC, and it was presented to a, a gifted young poet from Cincinnati, Taylor Bias, for, for her debut collection of poetry. And Writers for Readers also funds the Heartland Book Festival. Uh, and it was held for the first time uh, Friday night at the Folly Theater and then all day Saturday at the uh, Downtown Central Library and was a resounding success. Uh, Saturday alone drew more than 2,000 people and we're hoping to make that an, an annual event. We do that in partnership with Missouri Humanities which is based in St. Louis. And then coming up is our big one. Um, on December 5th, we mark the 150th anniversary of the founding of the Kansas City Public Library in 1873. Thank you. I can't claim credit for all 150 years, nor I, don't, I think would the library want me to be associated with all 150 years. But we're planning a full, full year of, of special events. Um, Series of notable speakers, uh, Margaret Atwood among them, uh, rem remembrances and other activities all the way through uh, December of 2024, full year. And, and we'll look forward to having you all join us uh, as we do that. Um, tonight, we, we welcome back our close partner, U.S. Army Command and General Staff College at Fort Leavenworth and one of our favorite presenters from the college's deep and impressive lineup of military historians, Gates Brown. We're going to recount, if not the biggest, one of the biggest hold your breath moments in our, since our country was founded, uh, the Cuban Missile Crisis, 13, 13 day standoff that, with the Soviet Union that started 61 years ago next Monday. Gates is a, an associate professor in the Command and General Staff College's Department of Military History and was the college's Civilian Educator of the Year in 2021. He's a former Army captain, served in Operation Iraqi Freedom, and was injured in combat there. Uh, improvised uh, explosive device detonated under the vehicle he, he was riding in. He, uh, he briefly, after that, taught at the Command and General Staff College then he attended graduate school at KU through the uh, Wounded Warrior Education Initiative, earned a master's degree and then a doctorate in military history, and then returned to the Command and General Staff College to speak or to teach in 2015. This is the fifth time Gates has spoken here at the library, uh, all four times previously at the, uh, at the central lobby, library, first time here at the plaza. In, in a little more than five years. And he's covered World War II. He's covered the Roosevelt to Truman transition in the White House. He's covered the Middle East. And tonight he revisits a Cold War that unfortunately may be heating back up. As always, we'll leave time at the end of our program for, for Q&A. We'll ask everybody here to use microphones that we'll set up at the front. And that's very important because we are live streaming uh, and that way people back home, including, and then everybody here can hear the questions. Uh, and viewers at home can submit their questions at any time during the presentation uh, via the YouTube chat box. 
So now, would you please join me in welcoming Gates Brown back to the library and to uh, hear about the Cuban Missile Crisis. Gates? Thank you very much. Good evening. Thank you for coming out tonight. I really appreciate it. This is always a lot of fun. We're going to talk about the Cuban Missile Crisis, but I hope you'll indulge me because it may be a little bit different conversation than you were expecting. We're going to talk about the U.S. perspective, the Soviet perspective, but we're really going to discuss the Soviet and Chinese perspective. Because this is often what we think of with the Cuban Missile Crisis, that it's Kennedy and Khrushchev and they are staring into the abyss and which one is going to blink first. The problem with this is Castro's nowhere in that. It happens in Cuba. We call it the Cuban Missile Crisis. The Soviets call it the Caribbean Crisis. But Castro's not depicted there. Castro's also not really important in a lot of our narrative. He's also not going to be as important tonight. But what we are going to talk about is what's going on between the Soviet Union and the People's Republic of China. Because the theme is turning points, and what's interesting about this event is it's a catalyst for change, yes, between the Soviet Union and the United States, but also in the socialist world. There's a little bit of a cold war between the People's Republic of China and the Soviet Union about which has the right read on the worldwide revolution. Which is the correct path to follow? Who's the real leader of the global socialist revolution that both sides think that they are leading? So we're going to see how the Cuban Missile Crisis changes the relationship between the Soviet Union and the People's Republic of China and talk about what are the implications for the Cold War, for the U.S.-Soviet relationship, and how can that help us better understand international crises today? To do that, we have to answer a couple of questions. Why does Khrushchev want, the, want missiles in Cuba in the first place? Then we're going to discuss the resolution of the crisis. That's that general 12 days, 13 days where the world's on tenterhooks and nobody knows what's going to happen. We're going to go through that pretty quickly, but I promise we are going to talk about it to a degree. And then we're going to spend some time on the implications. What does this do for the Soviet Union? What does this do for the People's Republic of China? How does this shape the socialist Cold War between those two powers? And then finally, we'll end with why is this important today? 60 years ago, the Soviet Union no longer exists. Castro is dead. China is a communist power, but not nearly in the way that it was when Mao was leading it. So why is this still a relevant issue today? The luxury of giving history talks is we never actually start with the topic that we're discussing, right? <laughs> so we have to go back before we can go forward. Why does Khrushchev want these missiles in Cuba so desperately? And why is he willing to risk global catastrophe to do it? Well, this is Sputnik. It is the first man-made satellite that the Soviets put into orbit. And when this happens in 1956, the Eisenhower administration and President Eisenhower specifically isn't real concerned. It seems like an interesting science experiment. All it does is it goes around the world and it beeps. It can't send out real detailed information. It can't receive information. It just, it just beeps. And so President Eisenhower is unimpressed. Also, he knows that he's got programs in the work. The United States has a satellite program. Give him time. We're going to do something that's so much better than what the Soviets are doing. But that's not how the U.S. public perceives this capability. Because the trouble is, if you can launch this thing around the world, well, what can you launch halfway around the world? And there's a real concern that this is not an atypical example of Soviet engineering and technology, but this is broadly representative of what the Soviets can do, and maybe they can do it consistently. 
This isn't helped by the fact that Khrushchev, after the Soviet launch, is going to use the remaining years in the 1950s to hammer home that the Soviet Union is going to produce missiles like hot dogs. He also is going to change the organization of the Soviet military. It's going to have a missile force in a way that the United States has an air force and an army and a navy. The Soviet military will have a missile branch. And so it seems like maybe the Soviets have stolen a march on the United States. And this is much different than man bombers. Man bombers, if they're detected early enough, you've got a couple hours to scramble your own jets, to release Strategic Air Command man bombers that are constantly on patrol on the periphery of the Soviet Union to deliver their bombs to Soviet targets. And so man bombers present a threat, but a threat with some defenses, some ability to react. Missiles don't. If you detect the missile, you're probably not going to detect it at launch because this is a time before you have sophisticated global satellite coverage where you know immediately where, when, and approximately how big the launch is, almost instantaneously. You're going to detect the missile maybe when it's coming into your radar bubble, the distant early warning line, which is in the northern reaches of Canada. So instead of a couple hours, you have maybe tens of minutes. And in those minutes, you can't scramble fighters because fighters can't stop a missile. You can't scramble bombers because, again, it's already too late. So the thing you can do is quickly get your family and go into the bomb shelter or find the fallout shelter. And you can see how this changes U.S. perceptions about security in the Cold War. And it doesn't seem like there's an immediate solution. But the Eisenhower administration has some ideas. They have several missiles in middle stages of development, intermediate range ballistic missiles, about 1,500 miles of range. And they can get those to a deployable state pretty quickly in a matter of a couple of years. But that doesn't solve the range issue because you can't hit the Soviet Union from the continental United States with a missile that goes about 1,500 miles. But as you can see from the map on your left, my right, you can if you don't put them in the United States, if you put them in Europe. And so in the late 1950s, early 1960s, the United States is going to deploy intermediate range ballistic missiles, the Jupiter and the Thor, to Turkey, Italy, and Britain. And this is going to address that perceived asymmetric capability that the Soviets had with the launch of Sputnik. And in fact, it's not going to level that asymmetric advantage, it's actually going to provide an asymmetric advantage to the Soviet Union. Because while the United States population is worried about the space race and Sputnik, what Eisenhower understands as he starts to get into the later 1950s and by early 1960, 61, as he's leaving office, is there is a missile gap, but that missile gap benefits the United States. So this is one of the main reasons that Khrushchev wants to get the missiles in Cuba. You need to redress this asymmetric capability that the United States has. As you can see, the missiles in Turkey can hit Moscow, they can hit Leningrad, and many other strategic targets in the western part of the Soviet Union. And the Soviet Union doesn't have a good immediate answer for this. But that doesn't necessarily tell us why Cuba is excited about the missiles or necessarily why Cuba. I know Cuba's not on the map, so no. <laughs> After World War II, the decolonization movement, the revolutionary movement in the world really starts to pick up the pace. You see a lot of these happen in Asia and the Middle East. Notice one of the countries that's not highlighted is China, but China is going to play a critical role in the Korean War, which from the Chinese perspective and a Soviet perspective is a continuation of the revolution that starts after the Koreans are liberated from the Japanese. They're also going to play a critical role in what's going on in Indochina. 
Though Mao's China sees itself as the vanguard of this militant revolution that's sweeping Asia and the Middle East, and in the 1960s, will start to get into Africa. The Soviet Union has a little bit different perception about how to prosecute that revolution. We'll talk about that in a minute. But at the end of the 1950s, this revolutionary wave comes into the Western Hemisphere in Cuba. In 1959, the Batiste regime is going to be overthrown by a small group of revolutionaries. And while there are communists in the revolution, it's not overtly a communist revolution. A lot of times we look at the Castro regime through the lens of our experience of decades of Castro being a communist in that state being a communist state. But what's important to understand is initially there's some hope. We were at Castro and Vice President Nixon together. Castro is going to come to New York. He's going to get a parade in New York City. People talk about him as maybe a new type of George Washington figure. Because what he's doing is overthrowing an oppressive and corrupt regime. And while the United States had a lot of economic interest in Cuba, there's not a whole lot of tears shed for the Baptiste regime initially. But things are going to change. Because once Castro's in power, he's going to start taking action. He's going to make the economy of Cuba work for Cubans as he understands it. Now, the problem with that is, from the Eisenhower administration's perspective, that seems an awful lot like socialism. And so this initial hope, this initial optimism, starts to wane as you get into 1960. And there's real concern that instead of a bearded George Washington, maybe what you have is a Karl Marx, 90 miles from the United States. But what do you do about it? One of the things that's going to happen through the 1960 campaign is Kennedy is going to run on a platform that the Eisenhower administration has good intention. But they're just tired that Eisenhower, the great American World War II hero, but honestly, he doesn't have the energy or vigor to lead the world, and neither does his vice president, who's running to maintain the presidency. That Kennedy's going to have a more vigorous Cold War policy. He's going to prosecute it. He's going to bear any burden and pay any price, as he'll say in his inauguration speech. He's also going to call out the missile gap. And remember, Eisenhower is getting better intelligence. He's un he understands that the United States is in a good position. But you can't talk about that publicly, even though it would be politically convenient, because you will give away your sources and your methods of intelligence collection. And so the Kennedy campaign is going to talk about a missile gap, that the Soviet Union is in a better position in the Cold War than the United States. And we'll see how that's going to feed in to some of the early decisions that Kennedy makes. But before we get there, we have to kind of go back a little bit again and talk about another reason why Khrushchev wants to put the missiles in Cuba. We discussed the fact that China has been paying in blood for the socialist revolution in Asia. Well, Khrushchev also considers himself something of a revolutionary. He's a true believer in the Soviet Union. And what he wants is a chance to show that the Soviet Union can bury the United States. Now, he says that in an aggressive tone, and it sounds bad, but he's talking about burying the United States in, in economic terms, not necessarily under an irradiated pile of debris. But this tension between Mao and Khrushchev about the Cold War and about the Sino-Soviet relationship really starts to be problematic. After the death of Stalin, Mao wanted to have more prestige in the socialist world. China is a huge country. 
China is fighting in the Cold War against, from a Chinese perspective and Soviet perspective, the imperialist aggressors who are always trying to stop these revolutions. And what do the Soviets do? Well, the Soviets give us stuff. And that's all well and good, but the Chinese are actually giving bodies. And they need that, Mao wants that recognized in treaties and power relationships, but it's not happening. On top of that, what Khrushchev wants to do is be the nice guy. Khrushchev is going to give a secret speech, which ironically is not going to stay secret very long, at the 20th Party Congress in the middle of the 1950s and talk about how oppressive Stalin was. Not surprising for us today, but at the time, it was very controversial because the leader of the Soviet Union was denouncing Stalin, the leader who led the Soviets not only through World War II, the Great Patriotic War, but also led them through significant economic change with mass collectivization and mass industrialization. And for Khrushchev to argue that Stalin was wrong is incredibly controversial. And some take him up on it. So you've got a bear with a satellite independence. You've got occupied countries, Warsaw occupied, Warsaw Pact occupied countries that are asking, hey, why, if Stalin's so bad and using violence is not great, well, then why can't we raise up? And you won't use violence against us. Actually, he does, right? This, this whole de-Stalinization, the nice guy routine only goes so far. What Khrushchev's doing through the 1950s is trying to decrease the tension in the Cold War. Because what he wants is something like detente between the United States and the Soviet Union. Because what that will allow is him to take more Soviet economic capacity and dedicate it to consumer production and away from missiles and tanks and guns and really allow socialism to prove its advantage over capitalism. And I know we hear things like that and we, we know the end of the story, right? The Soviet Union does not endure. We understand that. But Khrushchev doesn't. He's a true believer. And he thinks that if only the socialist economy were given the space to operate, that it could show it could provide for the Soviet people. The problem is Mao. Because while Khrushchev is going on his peace tour, talking about decreasing the tension in the Cold War, talking about peaceful coexistence, a term that was anathema to Stalin, Mao realizes an opportunity. This is a joyous picture, but it depicts something that is not joyful. This is about the great leap forward. And you see a man standing on a cog, surfing. He's, got, he's followed by a woman who's also surfing a tractor. And then you probably can't see, but there's Mao on a missile in the background with his little red book. Mao wants to take the lead of the socialist world. If Khrushchev is taking a step back, talking about getting along with the imperialist, talking about moving away from violence in the socialist revolution, well, that's only more evidence that the Soviets are happy sacrificing the global south and Asia to continue depression. And the Chinese are the ones that are going to step up and lead the socialist world. First, through domestic changes with the Great Leap Forward, which is going to require mass collectivization and mass industrialization and also through a renewed foreign policy that China is going to sell its version of revolution that's more militant, that focuses on armed revolution, as opposed to Khrushchev's focus on peaceful evolution to socialism. And this is the state of play as we get into 1961, as Kennedy is assuming office and he's faced with a very important decision. But before we get there, I can't not mention the reality of the Great Leap Forward. Because in contrast to the picture that we saw before with people happy, smiling, 
this is the reality of Mao's dedication to communism. It's millions of people dying deaths of starvation and dying deaths in re-education. He does this to solidify his position domestically, but also to solidify his position ideologically. Oftentimes we dismiss ideology as a motivating factor because we tend to look at things culturally through a lens that focuses on real capabilities or real powers or real interests as we understand them, and we tend to downplay the influence of ideas on decision makers or policy makers. But that removes a vital element driving both Khrushchev and Mao. They fundamentally believe in what they're doing. And yes, it's catastrophic, and yes, millions of people are going to die, but for Mao, that's the price necessary to show the validity of communist ideology. So by the time we get to 1961, Mao is moving away from the Great Leap Forward because he's forced to, but he's not moving away from militant communist revolution. He's not moving away from trying to lead the socialist world at the expense of the Soviet Union. Khrushchev similarly is getting frustrated because the Chinese keep hitting the Soviets about the head and face with these ideological attacks. And shouldn't they understand their place? That they are second in the socialist world. Back to Cuba, right? Because we're supposed to talk about Cuba. So, 1961, Kennedy's assumed office. You have this increasingly socialist revolution, not overtly socialist, but socialists more in practice. Castro is not leaning to one side, he's on one side, but he hasn't said that he is a communist. There are communists in the hierarchy of Castro's government, but he himself hasn't admitted that Cuba is a communist state. But he's reaching out to both the Soviets and the Chinese asking for help. Because the United States, he tells them, won't accept this new revolution. They can't. The United States is too worried about real freedom so close to the continental United States. And Khrushchev doesn't do anything initially. Because remember, he wants to keep tensions between the United States and the Soviet Union as low as possible. And they're already tense because of issues in Berlin, because of issues in Europe. You don't want to add fuel to the fire. But Kennedy's decision to use Eisenhower's plan for the Bay of Pigs is one of the first catalysts that we'll talk about tonight. Because what it does is it shows that maybe Castro's not paranoid, maybe Castro's right, that the United States is not going to accept the existence of the Cuban Revolution. It also is going to be the thing that's going to make Castro be more overt in his political identification. He's going to say, okay, Cuba is communist. And what that's going to do is open an opportunity for Khrushchev. Because now, Khrushchev can be the guy who's at the forefront of the socialist revolution. Yes, important things happen in Asia. You had hundreds of thousands of Chinese volunteers fighting in Korea. That's all well and good. You have thousands of Chinese technicians going in to Indochina and advising the Vietnamese, all well and good. But here are the Soviets stepping up and helping this nascent socialist revolution against the United States at the doorstep of the continental United States. And not only helping in terms of material support or economic support, but with nuclear missiles. This is pretty good. And so that's the second main motivation. We can debate which one's more important or not. What's important to understand, it's two birds with one stone. You get to address that asymmetric capability advantage the United States had with its European-based missiles. Now, you get to do the same thing to the United States. And in fact, Khrushchev's going to get this idea 
when he's sitting in his zaka on the Black Sea, thinking about these missiles across the water, and he just gets furious because he has to accept them as a reality. He can't do anything to move them. And he wonders, why can't the United States be forced to accept the same thing? And that catalyst in the spring of 1962, that germ of an idea is going to lead to the crisis. One of the things I haven't got a good answer on is why he has to do it or feels like he has to do it surreptitiously. And what I mean by that is certainly the talks between Cuba and the Soviet Union, those, those have to be secret, but you can be a little bit more public about the deployment of the missiles because the missiles the United States has are already there. And you could have some type of rhetoric that discusses the need to protect the sovereignty of Cuba, the right for people to determine their own form of government. And the best way to do that is put purely defensive missiles in Cuba that would stop the United States. And the only thing the United States would understand would be massive retaliatory force, to use a turn of phrase from the Eisenhower administration. That's not the way Khrushchev does it. Khrushchev wants to do this completely in secret and then produce these as a fait accompli in November after the midterm elections in the United States and present the Kennedy administration with operational medium range and intermediate range ballistic missiles. But how do we find out about these things and what drives this conflict? We've seen that for Khrushchev, there's the capability gap that he's addressing. There's also the ideological rift or conflict that he's trying to fight with the Chinese. Now, in the United States, the Kennedy administration is pretty frustrated after the Bay of Pigs. That was handed to Kennedy almost as a turnkey operation that the CIA under Eisenhower had trained these guys. They're ready to go. Intelligence says that the, that the Cubans won't expect a thing. Joint Chiefs are pretty optimistic about the chances for success, so Kennedy says, okay. Because remember, he ran on being an energetic cold warrior. So there's a little bit of irony that this energetic cold warrior takes a plan from the supposedly exhausted Eisenhower administration. But it doesn't work out. And that's going to cause some tension between Kennedy and his uniform advisors, but also between Kennedy and Hawks who are around him proposing more aggressive policy decisions. As you get into the summer of 1962, there's a lot of human intelligence that the United States is getting from people on the island about increased Soviet presence, about a lot of weird construction that's happening, but you can't confirm or deny it because you can't put more people on the island. Your people got kicked off. You also have some difficulty getting image intelligence because in August of 1962, a Taiwanese U-2 got shot down over China. Two years prior, in 1960, a U-2 operated by the United States got shot down over the Soviet Union. So you know that the Soviets have effective radar capability and anti-aircraft fire to attack U-2s. And as a risk mitigation effort, the Kennedy administration allows overflights, but only if you avoid Cuban airspace. So you can fly to the east of it, you can fly to the west of it and get glancing imagery, but you can't get anything right over top. And this is gonna continue until the middle of October. Now there is a workaround. There's a satellite, the Corona satellite, and they do schedule an overflight of the Corona satellite. And it's an interesting program that there is a satellite with physical film, it takes pictures, and then it jettisons those film, that film in orbit, and then a plane comes by and catches it midair on a parachute. It's fascinating. Yeah. It is absolutely fascinating. The problem is it has resolution about 35 feet and the U-2 is much better. So they get photographic intelligence from the satellites, but it doesn't allow them to confirm or deny this human intelligence. And the human intelligence is continuing to build, that the Soviets are really active. We don't know what's going on. They're moving a lot of dirt. And so they agree to allow 
U-2 overflights. And that's the picture that we see on 14 October. It's taken 14 October. It's not really going to be developed and interpreted till the next day. And then Kennedy is going to meet with the executive committee on the 16th of October. And what they're discussing is the layout of equipment. Because the Soviets, much like the United States Army today, they just have a plan for certain things, right? If the United States Army today needs to build a dining facility, they want to know, do you need a small, medium, or large? Because it doesn't matter what your site needs, we've got a plan. And we're just going to make the site fit our plan. And it's the same thing with these missiles. The Soviets know this type of missile requires this type of infrastructure. And the infrastructure is all above ground. We think about these types of missiles and we immediately think missile silos, Minutemen, ICBMs, that's not the type of missile we're discussing. We're talking missiles that stay above ground, missiles that largely are liquid fuel, that take time to prepare for launch. But they are long range missiles nonetheless. And so when you finally get good information, good intelligence that confirms the presence of these missiles in Cuba, now you have to act. And this is when the crisis really begins, 22 October, when Kennedy is going to address the nation. Now, why six days? You know, you know about this, you, you gotta go, well, you, you don't wanna go and just let them know that there's a problem. You know, we've identified these missiles and we have no idea what we're gonna do. Go to sleep, we'll talk to you tomorrow morning. Right? That's not, what, that doesn't instill a lot of confidence. You also wanna show the right resolve with the Soviets, because they don't know that you know. So the national announcement discusses the presence of the missiles, the presence of missile facilities, to be more precise. It also talks about a quarantine of the island, which is an interesting term, because we'd look at that and say, well, it's much more like a blockade. But in point of fact, a blockade is an act of war, and you do not want to declare war. Because remember, one of the things that Kennedy also wants to do is keep this Cold War on a relative even keel. You don't want to be escalatory, especially in the wake of the Bay of Pigs. You took a little bit of a risk, maybe a gamble, and it didn't work out. You don't really want to fight the Soviets directly over this if you don't have to, and especially if you're the one who could be seen as the aggressor. So you put it in terms of a quarantine, which for all intents and purposes, is like a blockade, but what you do is you align U.S. vessels where you know Soviet vessels have to come through to get to Cuba, and you force the Soviets to take the first move. Are they going to run the quarantine and then be the aggressors? While this is happening, you have a covert and overt diplomacy. The covert diplomacy is where there's discussion between Robert Kennedy and the Soviet ambassador about missiles in Turkey, missiles in Cuba, promises not to invade. Publicly, Khrushchev is talking about the missiles in Turkey, but the Kennedy administration doesn't want to make those part of the expressed deal, at least the publicly expressed deal. And so with the resolution, privately, we're going to let the Soviets know, we'll take the missiles out of Turkey. But publicly, we promise not to invade Cuba which is enough of a pretext for Khrushchev to admit that he's got what he wants because after all, the missiles were only there to defend the Cuban Revolution and so it's a win for both. We'll see that not everybody buys that. One of the, per one of the people who really don't buy this win-win situation is Castro because he's not consulted at all about the resolution. He signs a bilateral agreement with the Soviet Union that guarantees him not only these missiles be placed in Cuba, the Cubans are never going to have ownership of the long-range missiles, but there are winged bombers, that there are talks of the Cubans maybe assuming ownership of those. There are tactical nuclear weapons. Again, the Cubans aren't going to get tactical nuclear weapons, but the Kennedy administration doesn't know about the tactical nuclear weapons at all, and they're operational on the island from the beginning of the conflict. There's also significant Soviet military presence on the island because what the Soviets are trying to guard against is an amphibious assault 
on Cuba to overtake the launchers. And that's one of the courses of action that Kennedy's advisors, the more hawkish ones, are pushing on him throughout the conflict, is we need to be strong and we need to be energetic. We need to invade Cuba or bomb Cuba. But both Kennedy and Khrushchev understand this can get sideways really quickly. So Castro is going to find out that this partner he has with the Soviet Union is very one-sided. He's going to lose the bombers. He's going to lose the anti-aircraft positions that he has. He's going to lose the Soviet military there. He's going to keep some economic support. But a lot of the things he thought would help guarantee his revolution, those are going to be unilaterally withdrawn. And the promise is the word of President Kennedy that the United States will not invade Cuba. You can see how that may be a little cold comfort for Castro. Another person who's not buying the win-win narrative is Mao. He is going to argue that what this shows is the resolve of the United States, because Kennedy made Khrushchev blink. It shows the resolve of the Cubans. The Cubans were more than willing to go to the mats for these missiles. And it shows the lack of backbone of Khrushchev. And all this sounds like inside baseball to us. But at the point in the Cold War, it is surprising the reach of Chinese propaganda inside the Soviet Union. Because the Chinese are printing thousands of leaflets circulating inside the Soviet Union about the lack of revolutionary spirit in Soviet leadership. And Soviet citizens start to wonder if that's true. We see here Che Guevara and Mao. Che is going to have a continued career as a revolutionary. One is focused on militancy. That's Mao's version of revolution, where Khrushchev focused more in the 1950s ostensibly on peaceful evolution to socialism. Mao says, no, it's got to be armed revolution. And so it seems in this Sino-Soviet Cold War that in the immediate aftermath of the Cuban Missile Crisis, it only fuels China's legitimacy. But Khrushchev is not long for the premiership of the Soviet Union. In 1964, he's going to be asked to experience a graceful retirement. And Leonid Brezhnev is going to come to lead the Soviet Union. What's interesting about Brezhnev is he understands you can't risk atomic war with the United States. That, the Cuban Missile Crisis, we can all agree that's what happens. But that propaganda poster is about Soviet help for the Vietnamese Revolution. After the Gulf of Tonkin incident in 1964, Brezhnev sees the Vietnam War as the best vehicle to show that the Soviets aren't out of leading the worldwide revolution. And it's going to mean the Soviets are going to be involved in a big way. Again, not with people as much as with materiel. They're going to fund the Vietnamese sophisticated anti-aircraft system that's going to shoot down a lot of US planes bombing North Vietnam. It's something that the Vietnamese had no hope of getting on their own, and the Soviets are going to give that to them in part of this effort to show Soviet leadership in the socialist revolution. Another participant in advocating for socialist revolution is Mao. Remember we saw how Mao believes that this Cuban Missile Crisis shows the legitimacy of the Chinese method of revolutionary war. And here he is with Ho Chi Minh. The Chinese are going to give a lot of munitions and equipment to the Vietnamese. But what's different with the Chinese support is Mao actually doesn't care about the, the Vietnamese final win. What he wants is to continue the conflict. Because as long as the conflict is going on, it allows China to talk about its leadership in the worldwide revolution. So in fact, he doesn't want them necessarily to win. He wants them to continue to fight. And it's not to say that Vietnam wouldn't have been 
problematic for the United States, so that the Soviet Union wouldn't have been involved in Vietnam without the Cuban Missile Crisis. But what it does show is this Sino-Soviet Cold War colors both leaders in understanding why this conflict is important. And it shows the influence of the Cuban Missile Crisis that has a relatively neat narrative from a US perspective that we find out about missiles, Kennedy gets really angry, addresses the nation, shows calm resolve, doesn't escalate the situation, and then the Soviets blink, they take the missiles away, we're the good guys, they're the bad guys, it's a nice, neat story. But in point of fact, it's not quite that nice or neat, especially when we look at different perspectives. And that, I think, is one of the benefits of looking at this conflict 60 years ago, is we have a lot more access to Soviet language sources and Chinese language sources and, to an extent, Cuban sources than we ever had in the 1960s. It allows us to better understand the role that ideology plays in the conflict. It allows us to better understand how this conflict shaped decision makers' understanding of subsequent events. And it helps us better understand the role of ideology. And I think when we look at this conflict today, we can still see how important it is to understand when your adversaries tell you what's important to them, not to be dismissive. Too often, we look at ideology as a, a cynical propaganda push or as rationalization for holding on to power. And it may be that to some, but it's not that to all. Oftentimes, our adversaries really believe in the things that they say, and we would be better suited to take them at their word. Thank you. Thank you so much, Gates. We've got uh, time for some questions. Again, if you'll come up to the front and use the microphones. Um, one of the things that uh, I would like to bring up is that Vietnam and China have been bitter enemies for thousands of years. Mm -hmm. Uh, in fact, they've, uh, they fought a war in 79 between... So, so the next one, the Vietnamese will fight. Yep. Right, and, 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 you know, so how did that, when China sort of helped Vietnam in, mm -hmm. in, the, in the Vietnam War, but as you say, didn't want them to win, they just wanted to fight. And so was there that, maybe the Chinese say, well, we really don't like Vietnam that well in the first place, <laughs> that that kind of fed into the fact that they didn't really want them to win, they just wanted them to bleed, bleed yeah, so each other. Yeah, that, so that's a good point. Now, there's no love loss from the Vietnamese side either, and in fact, one of the things the Vietnamese are gonna do phenomenally well throughout the conflict is play the Chinese and the Soviets against each other, because they understand that there's jockeying for positions inside the socialist world. And so, at some points, the Vietnamese will be closer to the Chinese, because they know that'll frustrate the Soviets, and then they can ask for more stuff, or they'll be closer to the Soviets, because they know that'll frustrate the Chinese. And one of the things that's going to change that dynamic is in the early 1970s when Nixon, now he's, he's in office, right? Didn't happen in 1960, it's gonna happen later. He's gonna leverage detente in a way that Khrushchev was never able to and frustrate the Vietnamese capability to play the Chinese off of the Soviets. But you're right that the Vietnamese understand that the Chinese don't have their best interest at heart and the Chinese don't really have a lot of love lost for the Vietnamese. But in terms of a socialist revolution that can show the legitimacy of Maoist view of revolutionary, of socialist revolution, that is why the Chinese are there. Yeah. So you said it's important uh, for uh, the United States or a state to know the motivations of the other side. So if the United States had really understood the motivations of their adversary, how might their reaction have been different? <laughs> so the lucky thing that I have as a historian is I don't have to worry necessarily about that aspect of it, but it, it's a good question. And especially if we look at the narrow constraints of what Kennedy is doing if we 
kind of start the clock in October 1962 that you find out there are missiles. There's really not much more he could do, right? You, you can't accept the missiles. You could, but it, it's hard to see how that would be a, a good course of action. And so I don't think in the immediate aspect of the Cuban Missile Crisis, it would be helpful for Kennedy to understand the broader discussions as far as policy options. With the resolution, though, maybe understanding that Khrushchev feels that the United States has an asymmetric capability gap, and he's trying to address that. He's also dealing with some internecine tensions in the socialist world. Is there a way that we can give him a rhetorical win and not just put more pressure on him? Maybe that's a way that having a better holistic understanding, not in terms of accepting the missiles, but in terms of finding a resolution that's maybe not as, I don't say humiliating, but as negative for Khrushchev or allows itself to be played as negatively in the socialist world. But then again, what can Kennedy do? I think in terms of understanding a broader discussion, that's, a, that's better applied to Eisenhower's decision to deploy those missiles in the 1950s, and that there's not as much discussion from the US perspective about what are we doing to the Soviets when we do this, and how will they understand it? We look at this and say, well, we're only doing this because of Soviet aggression. This is purely defensive. We're never going to start a world war. We'll never be that type of regime. But the Soviets obviously don't believe that. So does that answer your question to a degree? Like 3D chess. <laughs> yeah, again, that's a luxury I have as a historian. I don't have to worry about playing 3D chess. Yeah. <laughs> um, you talked about Castro not being openly socialist in the beginning. But he was pretty much pretty leftist oh, throughout yeah. the whole revolution. And Che Guevara was certainly oh, yes. a socialist. Yes. Um, and then you were talking about how the US and Castro, the US was originally hoping for somewhat of a peace with Castro. But then we tried to kill him a bunch of times. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. like, yeah, you know, details. He wasn't, he wasn't. I don't think he ever saw the U.S. as a potential ally, but mm. he would certainly have rather not been attempted assassinated. <laughs> so, so don't you think it's yeah. our own fault that mm. peace between us and Cuba never worked out? Plus our six-decade blockade of them hasn't really <laughs> done us any favors. Okay, when we look at, got the good picture of Nixon and Castro, that's early stages. There is hope that, yeah, Castro's leftist, but the United States is in league with lots of folks that we kind of look at as leftists, right? If you look at Western Europe, there are a lot of policies in Western Europe that do not fly in the United States because, well, that's socialism, right? But if you talk to Western Europeans, they'll say, well, no, that's democracy and capitalism. We just happen to have a different definition. So. Sometimes what is leftist from, from our narrow perspective isn't necessarily the same thing as socialist. And that gap is something that the Eisenhower administration's hopeful in the initial stages, right? That yes, there are communists in the Cuban revolution. There are Chinese aligned communists, aligned communists, there are Soviet aligned communists, we talked about Che Guevara, who is definitely, he, not unquestionably, right? He's a communist revolutionary. But maybe if, you work with this guy, and it's not at the early stage where is he, is he gonna win, he's not gonna win, it's after the regime's already fallen that maybe I can make the best of a bad situation. So, got it, Castro won, Baptista's out, we're not gonna try to force a new regime on them, maybe we can play ball with this guy, what does he want? And initially, it seems like maybe you can do a deal with him. Is it to say that the United States and Cuba are gonna be allies? Probably not, but do they have to be as acrimonious as they will be? No. What changes is like you were saying, who continues to be influential and who rises in influence after the early stages of the revolution? So after this initial fanfare, Castro's gonna start making decisions and it's clear that he's listening to, sympathetic with, more closely aligned with the communist in his revolution and not with those folks that just had a beef with the corrupt Baptiste regime. And once that's evident, now you're in the dynamic of the Cold War. That yes, you can be 
leftist, but you can't be socialist communist, right? And if you are communist, that's right out. And so once Castro moves from uh, leftist curious to much more socialist, you can't have that 90 miles away from the United States. The other thing that I think is important to understand is the United States assessment of the regime is that it's got a toehold on Cuba. And in the same way that it's a ragtag group that throws out the Baptiste regime. It is like not. people. Yes. And so they thought, okay, if it's a ragtag group that overthrows the old regime, maybe another ragtag group can overthrow this regime and they'll be our guys, right? And when that doesn't happen and understanding, like you said, Castro, that incentivizes Castro to be even more aligned with the Soviets, okay, well now it's a communist country. We have to blockade it. Is that? But I mean, just because the U.S. doesn't understand leftists and socialists doesn't mean that there isn't like a set definition. Like leftists are always anti-capitalist. Liberals yeah. are pro-capitalist. So, well, here's where I would hesitate to say leftist equal anti-capitalist in that when you're turning leftist, you're collapsing a lot of nuance there. Right? So you can be left in the United States and from be social capitalist. democrat to like full on Marxist. Right, but that, that's a capitalist. Right, but that's a that's a really edge case of left. Right? You can be left of center and want a broader social safety net and still think capitalism is the best economic engine to fund that safety net. But that would and still not make be, you a liberal. It would but understand when you say leftist, in the terms of the United States parlance, that is Democrat, that is Democrat socialist, that is like you said, all the way on the so But the we're, US we're collapsing. Is wrong. I'm sorry? The U.S. is wrong. Like, I hate to say that we're, we're using a whole lot of relativistic terms that have purchased a lot outside of just the U.S. narrative. So when we That's say true. leftist, what I'm talking about is what is the United States connotation of leftist? When you're saying leftist, there's some baggage in there that I'm, I'm not agreeing is universally but true. But the so. U.S.'s Overton window has shifted consistently to the right, well, pretty much since we started as a country. And so, despite our perception of leftist being anyone from Joe Biden to like Karl Marx, it doesn't mean that the rest of the world isn't like, yeah, Joe Biden is center right, pretty much. <laughs> yeah, but it, it's also, remember we're talking about US policy was the framework of the discussion, right? So that, yeah. that's why my answer was rooted in, in a US reference discussion of what's left and right, and how the Castro regime initially positions itself in that. I'm sorry, I, I think we're gonna <laughs> keep talking past each other. So Maybe. we've got. Um, I know that Kevin Costner movie was wildly inaccurate. I have seen <laughs> right, it a couple of, or you just say the least. Now he did emphasize the role of Robert Kennedy, I guess we'd say senior now, since yeah. the other one we know about, um, and fine. And, uh, but, was there any role of Dean Rusk and the State Department and the Monroe Doctrine in this whole thing? And I say that because I was in eighth grade when this thing, mm -hmm. when Kennedy was elected, and we were made to, in my social society, memorize this vigorous new president's cabinet. Yeah. So I still remember all this stuff. You know. Anyway. <laughs> yeah. no, well done. Your education yeah. has proven its value. Yeah. So a lot of what we know about Robert Kennedy's role comes from Robert Kennedy's memoirs about this, which mm -hmm. those are self-serving. And, and I don't want to say that they're sure. inaccurate. It's just that when you write a memoir about your role in a certain thing, you're going to lionize some parts of it and downplay other parts of it. So there are a lot of other actors feeding into Kennedy's decision making. Yes, you've got State Department in there that are advising him about possible courses of action and implications. and being go-betweens between the Soviets and the United States because you don't have direct communication in the way that you will. You know, there's the proverbial red phone, it, a teletype, but that's going to be after the Cuban Missile Crisis. Right. So yeah, it's not just Robert Kennedy. What Robert Kennedy is going to do, though, is be the primary conduit with the Soviet ambassador in the clandestine negotiations. And so you've kind of got a dual track where the State Department is going to be taking over the public overt diplomacy Mm -hmm. And then Robert Kennedy is operating more covertly, directly with the Soviet ambassador, trying to figure out, well, what can we agree to 
privately that we don't have to agree to publicly, and then the public debate the State Department's working through. But the State Department, Dean Rusk, they're all part of the discussions inside the administration when you kind of come back and try to inter intertwine both of those covert and overt negotiations into one coherent policy. But they're part was of the State Department kind of trying to mitigate the, the hockey people? So there, yeah, there are some in the State Department that are hawks. A lot of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, when they're brought in for their advice, they're going to be much more aggressive than Kennedy wants to. They're the ones that are kind of like, yes, we definitely need to bomb. We need to bomb. And Kennedy goes, I'm, I'm not sure that's the best way to do it. We should maybe let this thing play out. So in some instances, I don't, I don't want to say universally, but yes, you have some in the State Department that are a little bit more willing to let the situation evolve, whereas the Department of Defense is a little bit more aggressive in trying to, to seize the initiative, as it were, and drive events. Thanks. We'll make this the uh, final question, Gates. I've had the privilege of visiting Cuba twice, and you can see it's falling down around itself. I mean, even when Russia was supporting their economy, they didn't do anything but maintain where they lived and where they worked. Now that the Soviet has backed off as far as economic support, is there any hope that that, that country will ever become more democratic? The, the rulers control the army, and as long as you control the army, it's going to be tough to do anything because they've got three hots in a cot, they're not going to protest. Yeah, I, I don't know, honestly, it, what the prognosis would be for a modern day Cuba or a continued embargo, as was referenced earlier. I think the longer you get from the Cold War, some of that economic cooperation, there was precedent in the Cold War for trading with the Soviet Union, for trading with communist countries, but that doesn't seem to apply as well to Cuba, and any time there's been discussion of expanding some possible trade or reducing the blockade, that runs headlong against domestic politics, and that's a, a tough order, so I don't know. Sorry. Gates, thank you so much. It's so good to have you. We look forward to the next time. Thank all of you. Thank you very much. Have a great evening.